Good evening. It's a joy to welcome you to another one of our midweek Bible studies this evening. Uh, given that we're starting a new study this evening in the book of Acts, which is going to last us the next six months. Yes, we're, do, we're doing two different quarters, uh, even as we just recently did with Genesis. We'll be spending the next half a year in this book. And so for that reason, I want to give you a little bit of background information and an overview of the book before we dive into the first lesson this week. Uh, the name of the book, as it appears in the New Testament, I think in some ways is a bit misleading because it's entitled the Acts of the Apostles, but really there's only two apostles that figure prominently at all in the book. Uh, Peter, of course, is featured initially in the opening chapters, and Paul will later take center stage from chapter 9 on, on his missionary journeys. John, on the other hand, is only mentioned three times and merely as a companion of Peter in those early days of the life of the church in Jerusalem. Actually, the deacons Stephen and Philip get a lot more attention than any of the other uh, apostles other than uh, Paul and, and Peter. Uh, one could argue that a more fitting name for this book really would be the Acts of the Risen Lord, or perhaps even better than that, the Acts of the Holy Spirit, because the Holy Spirit appears by name more than 50 times in this uh, book as he empowers and directs the early church in its mission endeavors. Uh, the book of Acts covers approximately 33 years, from 30 AD or so to 63 AD, from the time of Jesus's resurrection until shortly after Nero blamed the Christians as scapegoats for the burning of Rome in 64 AD, for uh, which he himself was actually responsible for. Luke's authorship of this gospel, and as of the gospel of Luke, I should say, as well as the book of Acts, is indisputable among uh, noted biblical scholars. He's a physician, we learn in Colossians 4.14, uh, which would have made him an educated man. And he demonstrates a strong capacity as a researcher as he seeks to share historical details in his gospel about the life of Jesus and then in the book of Acts about the birth and spread of the early church. Uh, we know, too, that he was a faithful traveling companion of the Apostle Paul on at least some of his missionary journeys. And that's indicated by the we passages in which Luke places himself alongside Paul right in the middle of the action on some of his missionary journeys. And in a very poignant scene near the end of uh, Paul's life as he's writing his final letter, uh, 2 Timothy, Paul mentions that everyone else has deserted him or, has, or is elsewhere right at that moment in ministry, and only Luke is with him. Uh, those words are found in 2 Timothy chapter 4, verses 9 through 11. And in that same passage, uh, he points to a restored relationship because he asks Timothy to bring with him Mark when he comes because he's useful to Paul in the ministry. And that passage always just moves me because this is the same John Mark who bailed out on Paul and Barnabas on their first missionary journey and who Paul refused to take with them on their second journey. Uh, forcing Barnabas to take him. His, uh, he's a cousin of Barnabas. And, and so instead of having one missionary team, you had two because Paul teamed up with Silas on the second missionary journey. But as Paul writes this final letter, he now considers uh, John Mark a useful partner in ministry. It's a, a beautiful picture of restoration and the power of the gospel to, to restore uh, relationships. And we'll soon see clearly this evening in the first lesson that Luke's purpose in writing Acts was to continue the story of God's redemptive mission in the world that Jesus had begun as the early church is challenged to take the gospel message to the whole world in the power of the Holy Spirit. Now, both uh, the gospel and the book of Acts are addressed to the same individual, a man named Theophilus. The name literally means lover of God. Uh, Luke refers to him in his gospel in Luke 1, 3, as most excellent Theophilus. And that perhaps indicates he was a prominent person or maybe even a government official. Some, on the other hand, have interpreted him to be just a fictitious person, uh, making these writings, as it were, an open letter or a document to anyone who's interested in discovering who Jesus was and is and learning about the history of the movement that he began. And as we'll discover in our study of Acts, the work of preaching, teaching, healing, and sharing the gospel that Jesus began will now be carried on by his followers, the church, which is essentially birthed on the day of Pentecost. Well, our lesson for this evening begins in verse 4 of chapter 1. And Jesus had promised his disciples on the eve of his crucifixion multiple times that he would be sending them the Comforter, the Holy Spirit, in his place to be with them. And on the eve of that first Easter morning after his resurrection, as he met with them behind closed doors, he had instructed them not to leave Jerusalem, but to wait until they were clothed with power from on high. 
Uh, we read that in Luke 24, verse 49. And now he reiterates to them in verse 4 that command to tarry or to wait in Jerusalem for what the Father had promised. Well, you might ask, well, where had God promised to send his Spirit upon mankind? Well, Peter, <laughs> in his message on the day of Pentecost, cites a passage from Joel chapter 2, verses 28 through 32, where God announces that he's going to pour out his Spirit on all mankind in the last days. Uh, and Peter uh, appeals to that passage to explain the phenomenon that people are experiencing on the day of Pentecost. Uh, in Acts 2, 15 through 21, he cites that. Now, Jesus, as we've already heard him uh, say repeatedly, he had promised in that upper room discourse on the eve of his crucifixion that he would send them the Holy Spirit. And he spoke extensively of what the Spirit would do when he came. John 14, 16 through 18. John 14, 26. John 15, 26 through 27. And John 16, 7 through 15 are all extensive aspects of the discourse of Jesus in the upper room as he talked about the coming of the Holy Spirit. Well, in verse 5, Jesus contrasts John the Baptist's baptism with water with the baptism that they will experience of the Holy Spirit. John himself had declared with, when he was baptizing folks there in the Jordan River, uh, those who came to him in repentance, that one was coming after him who would baptize them in the Holy Spirit. Uh, Mark 1, 8 is that reference. As believers, we understand that the baptism of the Holy Spirit occurs at the time of our conversion. Paul indicates as much in 1 Corinthians 12, 13, where he writes, For by one spirit we were all baptized into one body, whether Jews or Greeks, whether slaves or free, and we were all made to drink of one spirit. And Paul argues as well in Romans that if we don't have the Spirit of God, having been baptized by him, we aren't Christians at all. He, he writes in Romans 8, 9, However, you are not in the flesh, but in the Spirit, if indeed the Spirit of God dwells in you. But if anyone does not have the Spirit of Christ, he does not belong to him. Now, many Pentecostal groups associate baptism in the Holy Spirit with speaking in tongues and, and working miracles, and they falsely assert that those who don't speak in tongues haven't experienced the Spirit's baptism. Jesus, <laughs> and, and Paul, as we've just seen, has, has clearly said that we all who are believers have been baptized by the one spirit and placed into his body. And if we don't have the spirit, we're not Christians at all. And Jesus tells his, his listeners now in verse five, that that experience of baptism in the Holy Spirit is coming soon. He says, not many days from now. Verse six shows us that the disciples are still locked in and focused on the question of Israel once again attaining its independence and prominence as a nation. They're still obsessed with the possibility that Jesus might uh, still be at this point thinking about establishing an earthly kingdom where they are going to be awarded positions of leadership and authority, even as they had clamored for earlier, the opportunity to sit at his right and left hand when he came into his glory. Uh, they had been under Roman rule at this point for almost 100 years, dating all the way back to 63 BC. And they certainly were longing for a messianic king to lead them to a military victory over Rome. So they anxiously asked Jesus at this point, "Is are you going to, at this, at this moment, uh, restore the kingdom to Israel? Is this the time that you're going to assert your kingdomship? And Jesus' reply to the disciples in verses 7 and 8, begins with the declaration, guys, this is way above your pay grade. It's not for you to know the times or the seasons, he says, that God in his sovereignty has established for such matters as these. And if we view Jesus' second coming as the time when those kind of issues are indeed going to be settled and clarified, we remember that Jesus himself said that no one knew the hour of his return, not even himself, but only God the Father. He spoke those words in Matthew 24, verse 36. Their task isn't to pursue an earthly kingdom, but to be messengers of the kingdom of God. Well, Jesus' answer goes on in verse 8 to give them both a promise and a command. The promise is that of an awesome source of power for them to carry out the mission that he's about to assign to them. He tells them that they'll receive this power, and the Greek word there is dunamis. Uh, it's a word that we get dynamo and dynamite from. They'll receive this power, he says, when the Holy Spirit comes upon them. In their own strength, that task of world evangelism is far beyond their capacity to achieve. But through the Spirit's empowering, the world will be turned upside down, as we read in Acts 17, verse 6. 
that power is granted by the Spirit for a specific purpose. They are to be Christ's witnesses. Now, a witness, of course, is someone who testifies to what he or she has seen and heard. The Greek word for witness is martyr, M-A-R-T-U-R. We get the English word martyr, M-A-R-T-Y-R, from that. And a martyr is obviously someone who dies for their faith. And many of the early Christians, the early disciples, would indeed die a martyr's death as they laid down their lives rather than denying their faith in Christ. Now, a witness who refuses to testify in a courtroom can be held in contempt of court by the judge, but Christians who fail to witness rob others of the chance of hearing the gospel and experiencing God's forgiveness. Well, Jesus promises the disciples not only power for their task, but he gives them a strategy as well for their spirit-empowered witnessing. And it has a geographical focus, a geographical element to it. He instructs them to begin where they are in the city of Jerusalem in verse 8. And from there, they're to expand into the surrounding area of Judea and what would be the southern part of Israel. Next, they're instructed to go into Samaria. This is significant because it represents cross-cultural evangelism. Now, while they're preaching in Jerusalem and Judea, they'd be sharing the gospel predominantly with their fellow Jews, with folks who shared a common language and a common culture. The Samaritans, on the other hand, were folks who were hated as less than pure bloods, pure blooded Jews, because they were the product of the intermarriages that occurred when many of the Israelites had been taken away into captivity as exiles to Nineveh and later to Babylon. And those who remained in the land intermarried with folks that the foreign conquerors had brought in to help ensure and control the land. And so they were never considered pure blood Jews and were certainly looked down on with disgust and disdain by, by, by the Jews. Well, the scope is widened even further in the final phrase of verse 8, extending beyond Samaria, where Jesus says they're to be witnesses even to the remotest part of the earth. Now, of course, their understanding of world geography in that day would have been considerably limited in comparison to our day when, when astronauts have been able to fly into space and, and t- take a picture of our entire globe. But Jesus' words encompass the entire planet and every nation and people group on earth. His desire is that everyone hears the gospel and has the opportunity to respond in faith and to be saved. Well, in verse 9, as the disciples uh, are looking on, we read that Jesus was taken up from them and ascends into heaven. Uh, A New Testament professor that I had back at Southwestern Seminary in my seminary days, Curtis Vaughn, cites five different significant aspects of this ascension of Jesus. He says, first of all, it was a necessary corollary of the resurrection. Otherwise, we simply have to assume that Jesus remained on earth and later died. Second, it conveyed to the disciples the the notion that the post-resurrection appearances of Jesus are now over. He's lingered there some 40 days after he was raised from the dead, but they will not see him longer. And that's the third truth. It, It suggests that Jesus is not going to be visibly present. We're not going to perceive him with our physical senses anymore, but rather with the eyes of faith through through spiritual insight. The fourth truth he cites is that it symbolizes his, his exaltation to the right hand of God. And finally, the fifth aspect of the ascension that uh, Dr. Vaughn notes is that it indicated the commencement or the beginning of his spiritual priesthood that's described in much further detail in the book of Hebrews. For example, in Hebrews 7.25, where we, we read that he ever lives to make intercession for us. We read as well in verse 9 that a cloud received them out of his sight or received him out of their sight. Uh, That scene is reminiscent of the Mount of Transfiguration, where Peter, James, and John were with Jesus as a cloud overshadowed them, and Moses and Elijah showed up and talked with Jesus about the things that were about to transpire in Jerusalem. We read that in uh, Luke 9.31. At that point, the voice of God is heard from that same cloud, instructing them to listen to Jesus' words. And that, that cloud uh, that receives Jesus also reminds us of the cloud of the divine presence that hovered over the tabernacle in the Old Testament days during the wilderness wandering of the Israelites. This cloud uh, on this occasion receives Jesus from their sight as he ascends into heaven. Well, in verses 10 and 11, we read of the appearance of two men dressed in white clothing. It's a typical description the Bible um, gives to angels who make uh, appearances and they address uh, the disciples as men of Galilee. 
And with the possible exception of Judas Iscariot, whose surname Iscariot has been interpreted by some scholars as meaning man of Kerioth, which was a town in southern Judea. With the possible exception of Judas, all the rest of the apostles were from Galilee. And that's a region that wasn't known for its prominence. And that suggests to us that Jesus chose very common, ordinary, average people with whom to launch this missionary movement that would impact the world. That ought to give us some hope and encouragement as well, that God can use us even with our limited uh, abilities. The angels asked them why they're staring intently into the sky as they watch Jesus ascend into, into the cloud. Uh, there's an implication here that it's time to do what Jesus has just commanded them to do, to wait in Jerusalem until the promised Holy Spirit comes to empower them for their missionary service. And the other statement that the angels make is designed to provide assurance to the disciples concerning something Jesus had recently spoken to them about on several occasions, his second coming. The angels reassure them that this very same Jesus, whom they witnessed ascending into heaven, is going to return in the same fashion as they've seen him go. Jesus had not only announced that truth to his disciples, but he'd also done so before the high priest on the eve of his crucifixion. When he was asked directly by the high priest, are you the son of the blessed one? In Mark 14, 61, Jesus responded in verse 62 saying, I am, and you shall see the son of man sitting at the right hand of power and coming with the clouds of heaven. Uh, there's a, the words of the old familiar hymn come to mind here. I, I serve a risen savior. He's in the world today. And by his spirit, we can know him. We're empowered by him to be his witnesses. And we also await his promised return. Mindful that he repeatedly instructed his disciples to do two things as they awaited his coming. To be watchful and also to be busy doing the work that he left for us to do. of Sharing our faith and making disciples of all the nations. Well, our lesson for today concludes with Luke recounting in verses 23 through 26 the actions that the remaining apostles took to replace Judas after he had committed suicide. Uh, we read that they interpreted Psalm 69, 25 and Psalm 109, verse 8 as indicating that his place should be occupied by another individual. And they deemed that this person should have been someone who had been with Jesus from the outset of his public ministry, even as they had been, and who had also been a witness to his resurrection. Well, two men were put forth as proposals as potential replacements for Judas. Joseph, who was also called Barsabbas, not to be confused with Barabbas, who, who the crowd demanded that Pilate release in place of uh, Jesus, and Matthias. And to confuse things just a little bit more still, Barsabbas, we read, was also called Justus, J-U-S-T-U-S. -U -U now, the apostles began this process in the right way. They they begin by praying and they acknowledge in their prayer that they're simply not up to the task of discerning which man to choose. They declare God alone knows people's hearts and they're basically asking him to indicate how to proceed in this selection process of coming up with a replacement for Judas. They utilize the Old Testament system of drawing or casting lots and we read that the lot fell to Matthias or Matthias. The Lifeway Quarterly writer correctly suggests, I believe, that this shouldn't be the methodology uh, we employ today to try and determine God's will, rolling the dice or doing something else like that. Uh, we've got far better resources at our disposal today, at our disposal today, uh, among those being the Holy Spirit, who we've talked about, who lives within us, who Jesus says would guide us into all truth. We have God's complete word, the entire canon of the Holy Scriptures, something that the early church didn't have. They had the Old Testament Scriptures only in, in those days. We also have the same resource of prayer that they utilized. And I'd add something to the author's suggested list of resources, and that is the counsel and, advi and advice of trusted friends and family members who've walked with the Lord for many years. Their insights and their suggestions and their, uh, their reflections can also be a source of guidance and insight for us as we seek God's specific will for us when we're determining a, a course of action to pursue. Well, I want to thank you for joining me this evening as we have begun this initial study that will take us uh, the next six months as we study the book of Acts and the life of the early church together. I want to thank you for joining me and invite you to pray with me as we conclude our study. Gracious Father, thank you so much once again for the privilege and opportunity you give us to study your word. Thank you, Lord, for the tremendous resource we have in the book of Acts that Luke uh, so carefully pens to record historical act, 
with accuracy uh, the events that transpired in the early days of the church as it was formed by the coming of the Holy Spirit and, and has you <laughs> empowered your church to go out as missionaries to the entire world. Lord, help us to be faithful in that same call, that same ministry, because we know that what you commissioned the disciples to do has come to be our task and our responsibility as well this day. So may we lean on you. May we be filled with your Holy Spirit as well for the task of sharing the good news with others. And give us opportunities to do that this very week, we pray in Jesus' name. Amen. Thank you so much for joining me this evening. I look forward to seeing you this coming Sunday. We'll be in our second series, a second of a series of sermons entitled Battles as we talk about God being the one who fights for us. And I hope to see you this coming Sunday. Bye for now.